is like it, it's so in here as opposed to like in the heart, the womb, the feet, the shifting, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so I'm wondering if those folks did any of that kind of work as they were um, doing things because I think sometimes revolution is a, for a lot of people is about yelling at you to change but not making any shift inside the person, him or herself, um, and within community and how we interact with each other and stuff like that. The second thing I want to mention that I've just been really thinking about, um, I've spent a lot of time living in Quebec, and fuck man, oh Steve, there's 80,000 people in the streets right now in fucking Montreal. We're sitting here in a room of like 20 people. Um, we had maybe 5,000, 10,000 people hanging out with us. You know, maybe 40,000, 50,000 other people in the burbs. There's only 7 million people in the whole freaking province of Quebec. And 185,000 students were out on strike. The workers, the fire people, which is really interesting because they went out on strike, there were fires, blah, blah, blah. Um, I guess I don't see Americans doing a revolution. I think there's a lot of complacency in our typical life. And because our life is so money focused and spending money to have education, to have food, to have rent, to da, 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 that you have to spend a lot of time accumulating that. Whereas I see these potential for revolutionary type things, going back to like, oh, I've left that kind of world behind. But I see that potential happening in other places because the average life of the average person, like they were striking because, it, you know, fees went up 75%. But if you only knew how much Quebecers paid for education, we would all be thrilled to pay that much, even 75% more. I mean, but it's a different world and it's a different thing. So, you know, as I'm spending the last few days, people are, you know, I hear a lot of people talking about revolution and I'm going, you know, man, I just, I don't see it. I, I see... I'd rather see us more central, uh, localized and you know, change the whole food production, change how we're living, changing how we're interacting with each other. And maybe if enough of us are doing that kind of thing, then we almost like sort of bypass the need for that whole centralized government structure, ridiculous Congress, Supreme Court that's doing bullshit stuff and you know, agribiz and all those other things. So those are just kind of the, some of the thoughts I'm having. And, Shit, if there's anybody in this room who's driving to Quebec in the next few days, <laughs> I'm in your back seat. <laughs> uh, uh, I'll start there. I was just I was just in Montreal over the weekend. Oh, fuck um, man. And, uh, and yeah, it's very it's just inspiring. You see people everywhere with a little red cloth patches yeah. safety pin to their shirts and if, if you see the um, picture, like there is a sea of red going up the streets in Montreal. Um so uh, that said, and, I, and when I gave a version of this talk in Montreal, I, at the point where I talked about um, you know, movements emerging from nowhere and um, yeah. their exactly. incredible dynamism, I said, you know, if I was writing this now, I'd of course be including the Quebec strike. Uh, that said, I, I think I, I, on a personal level, I strongly disagree with the, the, the notion that revolution is, um, is simply not on the table in this country, I don't, I don't, I don't perceive it as being likely. I, I, I like Knowles' line in in Black Worker White Worker about whoever said a revolution would be easy. Um, I think one thing that I talk about it that I spend part of one chapter describing STO's engagement with the anti-nuclear power movement of the late 1970s and early 1980s, um, and one thing that they consistently tried to sort of deal with was to argue against what was then this kind of emerging um, sort of an early version of some of the uh, kind of more new age drop out versions of what became the green movement in terms of um, if we all build homemade solar panels and we you know evade the the energy system that way then um, then we, you know that avoids the necessity for um, for revolutionary conflict, and, and they, they thought that that was false, and, and I would agree with them in that context and in, in a number of contemporary contexts. That said, the, your first point, I think, uh, serves as a, a effectively a valid criticism of, of one of STO's major failings, which was it was, um, I think, widely perceived by a lot of former members as not having been 
a, a particularly good home space for its members. Um, and I spend some of some time in the book describing some conflicts that emerged around questions of sort of internal dynamics around family life and around passions that brought people outside of the context of revolution. That's the, the bit where I talk about spectator sports and popular culture and these sorts of things that didn't necessarily sit easily in a group that said it was focused on these specific kind of left brain tasks of making a revolution. Um, no one that I know of in the group pursued a sort of explicitly spiritual path afterwards, although it's entirely possible that I simply didn't encounter those people. Um, there are a lot. I, I interviewed close to three dozen former members, but that's, I don't know, maybe a, a tenth or a fifteenth or a twentieth of the total of the former members. So there could have been a lot of other trajectories that I simply wasn't aware of. Um, but, um, but I would agree in the sense that the group in its era was not particularly good at sort of providing a rounded experience for its membership. At the same time, in its defense, it said that wasn't its purpose. Its purpose was not to be a group of people who really liked each other and found community together. It was to be a group that brought together people who had a similar analysis and were willing to take common action. So, um, yes? Just I didn't mean to, to, to start on this first, but just briefly about the you mentioned Canada. Twice in 1968, I was held up at the Canadian border for two and a half hours before they let me in the country. The first time was at Marjo Airport. The second time was at, uh, driving from Seattle to Vancouver. But anyway, um, for approximately 130,000 years, modern human, humanity has been in existence. And about 10,000 years ago, when governments came to existence because in a a tiny percentage of the population uh, domesticated plants and animals and had a similar community and then the privileged group developed a government. Mm -hmm. So governments came into existence to defend whatever group has the privileges in the society or, or the means of wealth manufactured. And all rebellions up until the Haitian Revolution was defeated. It was impossible for them to gain freedom. For thousands of years, people were massacred, peasants, uh, etc. Now, with the advent of capitalism and two classes, it has become possible to make a revolution, class against class. And the capitalist state maintains the means to smash all opposition around the world. There's the working class and there's the capitalist class. And if the working class takes power, and is not organized to maintain that power mm -hmm. with a government representing the working class, the former oppressors will overthrow it and massacre them. So there has to be an organization representing the interests of the new class that has a government representing the workers, a workers government. The democratic dictatorship of the working class is what it's called. And, and you say that you are anarchists, so I'd like to know that there's been many courageous anarchists in the past, yes, and, and I'm sure there are some today too. So that if the capitalist system is overthrown, what, how do you maintain it without having organization? How could a basketball team, a baseball team, or a fire department, if they're not organized with a program, be successful in winning a game or putting out a fire? I would, would not want to see an anarchist fire department right now if, they, if an emergency broke out in this building <laughs> and they didn't have an organization. We would be so, we're, we're, we're destroyed. Um, well, totally against anarchism. <laughs> <laughs> That's clear. Uh, I don't want to totally take the conversation away from STO and toward um, the, sort of my personal take on anarchism, but I would say for what it's worth that I think you misunderstand how the vast majority of all anarchists understand their politics um, when you describe anarchism as something that is entirely without organization. Um, uh, so we could we can go at that perhaps at a later time. I think in terms of perhaps how it relates to STO, uh, STO's uh, vision of how to create a broadly free and egalitarian society was always marked by a critical awareness of the pitfalls of prior revolutionary efforts. So that included uh, a number of 
um, things that people inside the group wrote about the failures of the Russian Revolution and of the Cuban and Chinese revolutions as sort of key markers um, in that process. Uh, you know, I think we can go back and forth about when the Russian Revolution goes wrong. There are a million different answers to that question. Um, but I would say that STO's answer was closer to um, an anarchist answer in terms of probably it was 1918 than it was to a uh, sort of traditional Maoist um, answer that says it was 1953 or whenever, the 56 in Khrushchev. Um, so I, again, I, we could we could probably have a, a wonderful dialogue about that, but I do want to see if there are, are other questions about either STO or it's sort of its specific legacy, rather than speaking to my own personal take. Yeah. I, had a que I had two questions about um, how STO disbanded, um, and was that like did that reflect like what 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 was involved in that, um, and sort of about the like how. It, people often see organizations disbanding as like a failure of the organization if that was at play. Um, and also, if you could speak a little bit more about like gender in, in the organization and, and how they um, um, theorized on, on gender. Yeah, thanks especially for that one, because it's one that I, I, I think is really important in terms of understanding STL. In terms of its, its, um, its ceasing to exist, it's very interesting. There is no recorded anything and people's memories get kind of imprecise. So my book says 1986, but it could have been 1987, it could have been late 1985, it's kind of unclear. Um, what basically happened is uh, a series of political disagreements combined with a sort of demoralization in the context of the Reagan revolution led to this attrition of all of the non-Chicago-based members. Um, and after that point, which is about the end of 1983, the group pretty much functioned as what anarchists would call an affinity group um, for a number of years after that. Uh, and then at a certain point, it simply ceased to function. The, the, the networks still existed, but it was they were networks where people were sort of maintaining friendships rather than networks where they were planning actions or developing a theory or anything like that. Um, so the question of gender is a very complicated one. Um, and I try to unpack it in a number of different ways in different parts of the book. Uh, STO always, start to finish, saw um, women as obviously being at a minimum half of the class um, and also as experiencing specific oppressions. Um, it focused a lot of effort at different points on trying to organize around issues that were of importance specifically to women, whether that was in um, factories where women were um, paid substantially lower than men doing the same work, or whether that was in um, hospitals where you had overwhelmingly female staff, or whether that was in um, social movement contexts around reproductive rights or whatever. Um, that was stuff that was, was hugely important to STL. What, what is interesting about STO's uh, perspective on things, I'd say, is that it had what I think of as a somewhat stilted, not totally inaccurate, but not very well-rounded view of what feminism was that led it to identify itself as, as effectively not a feminist organization. Um, and that developed over the course of the 1970s in opposition to the sort of rise of kind of bourgeois cultural feminism um, that was perceived as being overwhelmingly white in character. Uh, the criticism as far as it went was, I think, valid on a certain level, but it's notable, for instance, that even though a lot of very similar insights to STO's analysis of white supremacy um, were emerging from the sort of developing women of color radicalism seen in that era, that there's no record of any interface interaction between those currents. So I think of that as a sort of clear missed opportunity um, where STO could have learned enormous amounts and could have found um, potential allies in the areas of work that were important to it. Um, but because, for the most part, a lot of the women involved in that line of argumentation and activity didn't identify with a Leninist tradition, um, or at least not with the same one that STO thought was important, uh, it was just sort of ships crossing in the night. Um, at the same time, I'd say, it's too easy to simply 
sort of write off STO's, you know, sort of failure on that front as an overall failure to recognize the centrality of patriarchy and resistance to it. So it, it's a complicated picture, um, and you know, hopefully, the various parts of the book all coupled together kind of do justice to it. Other questions, comments? Yes. Okay, uh, let me get you since you haven't spoken yet. Um, uh, the, how much uh, interface, I guess, and stuff is interesting to me? Uh, do they have with a, uh, I don't know, like the old like Facing Reality group or like some of those other groups that you might call the old ultra left or something that they almost became the similar position as, but you know, as you described in, in describing a book, they're much more the genesis of them seems much more out of the new Congress movement. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's interesting because there's a version of people's understanding of the legacy of STO that draws this sort of straight line from CLR James to STO. And there, James was familiar with STO and did interacted with them a lot. Um, the real line of connection was largely through two individuals. Um, one was uh, Noel Ignatin, now Ignatia, and the other was Ken Lawrence, who I mentioned briefly in, in my readings. Um, Lawrence had been a member of Facing Reality uh, and didn't join STO until sort of later in the game, but knew a, pretty much all of the founding members in that wing of the left um, as, as STO was at the end of the 60s. And kind of, he's the person who introduced Noel to James, and so that you can sort of say that Lawrence is the, the kernel of some of that, um, even though at a later point when Lawrence is actively involved in the organization, he would often take the sort of most doctrinaire, old school Leninist vision, you know, in a way that was very different from the kind of unorthodox thing that James had going on. Um, so there is, there's a connection, um, but it's not as strong of a connection historically as is sometimes perceived, I think, by people who have um, a vision of STO that is based on a number of documents that highlight the Jamesian element, if you will, and that and Black Worker, White Worker, which I just read about, is one of those, clearly. It's, you, you read that and you can't help but see the influence of CLR James. And I excised from this reading a bunch of stuff in my narrative where I talk about the influence of James um, on that developing wing. But there were other people who had sort of a vision of, uh, you know, of a radical reinterpretation of Leninism that didn't draw on the Jamesian tradition at all, but were much more sort of Gramscian and that sort of thing. Um, and in terms of like other ultra left visions of Marxism, very little influence inside STO. STO was kind of scornful of a lot of that as you know, and this was sort of projecting in some ways, but that those are the people who only did theory, you know. Um, and that was certainly a criticism that other people made of STO after a certain point in time. So, you know, I think it was sort of maybe a little, hit a little close to home in some ways, but there really wasn't much of engagement with that tradition. So. Uh, okay, so Brian first. Oh, um, all right. One, two, three, four, <laughs> five. Okay. <laughs> You know, that's a good point. You haven't said anything, so let's take you first. Okay. I'm going to take it back to you a little bit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, two things. Like, one, you, sa you said you're part of a revolutionary organization. And so, you know, what is it, through, like, through your research about this organization, like, what lessons do you draw? And do you, like, I know you said there was lots of things that you wouldn't probably want to have in your organization, but, like, What's the lessons you're asking for? What is the role of a specific political organization, or revolutionary organization? Um, and then why did you choose this specific organization to research? Um, boy, uh, on the first one, I'd say there are a lot, but I could pick one that we haven't really touched on, and that is um, that a specific revolutionary organization provides an opportunity to reflect critically on engagement in mass activity and to develop sort of novel theoretical theorizations of that activity. Um, uh, and that is something that I, that I definitely would say I, I, I think my vision of how that could proceed changed 
through the process of researching how STO attempted to, to do that. Um, the, um, the second question about why I chose this project uh, is really kind of happenstance in some ways. Uh, and I talk about a little bit in the very beginning of the introduction of the book that in the mid-90s, um, a bunch of us who were sort of younger anarchists in Chicago through a couple of different you know, accidents of history, ended up meeting a number of former members of STF who were still kicking around Chicago and who were still interested in engaging with the radical left. Um, and to their credit, I think, they didn't simply say, um, you guys use a different label than the one we used, so we're not gonna touch you. They instead sort of said, what, you know, it was the same, they did kind of the same thing to us they did to the, the workers at Western Electric, really, because it began with, um, we were looking for a print shop that would print some posters for us, and the, the vestigial print shop that had once been SDO's in-house press was still operating, and the folks who ran it at the time um, basically gave us free labor for, um, for the poster printings, and that began this kind of dialogue. Through that, we ended up having lots of interesting political conversations. The print shop had a back closet that had a bunch of old STO documents that I um, got you know, copies of. Uh, and so it was really this sort of thing where it had been an, an, an influence on my political development. And at a certain point, I decided that if I was going to do a research project of some sort, which was something that I'd been thinking about for years, I was pretty well positioned to do a research project about STO in particular. So I guess that you know, was sort of this combination of political interest combined with feeling like I had a good head start on how I would take on the project. So, um, OK. So, right. Um, yeah, it's, uh, sort of two questions again. One is, uh, did they, to what extent did they, um, did they have links with organizations or um, like other groups? You know, whether it was community-based groups or other left groups or whatever. Um, and um, the second question is. Um, were there particular like individuals um, that they looked to, like CLR Gims, for example, or others mm -hmm. um, who were kind of like really central to to their their theory and their sure. practice and stuff like that? Um, and then, kind of a related question is like, how much how how uh, how much did they focus on like U.S. Like U.S. history and U.S.-based movements, mm -hmm. as opposed to the sort of traditional like Russian Revolution sure. type or Chinese Revolution or whatever that a lot of left groups were fixated with. Yeah. Um, so on the first one, um, they were constantly trying to engage a wide variety of groups at various levels. Um, a, a big thing for them for a long time was the concept of building a tendency, and that. What that meant changed over time, but the idea was always there's no way we can do this by ourselves, um, and it has to be, you know, we have to draw on people with whom we have substantial political disagreements, but we can work together, basically. Um, the second question there, they, if you look at the STO web archive, which is at sojournertruth.org, I believe, or no, sojournertruth.net. Um, there's a nice composite image of what was effectively STO's pantheon. Um, and it's um, Marx, Lenin, Gramsci, W.E.B. Du Bois, and C.L.R. James, um, which is an interesting sort of you know, difference from what I, some people have described to me as the history of shaving version. That's um, Marx with the big beard, and then you get <laughs> Lenin with the goatee, and you have Stalin with the mustache, and Mao with clean shaven. Um, <laughs> uh, so, um, so anyway, if you look at that website, it's kind of in that same, the same kind of like red tones that you expect to see in kind of capital C communist, you know, iconography. Um, so that that really was their um, their sort of a list of these are their intellectual mentors. And and the inclusion of both Du Bois and James, I think, gives you a sense of the importance that history generally played for them, and US history in particular. Um, for them, the most important Du Bois document was Black Reconstruction, um, his mammoth history of the, the Civil War and its aftermath, 
from the perspective of the black worker. Uh, and yeah, absolutely, they saw so much that was unique in the trajectory of US history that didn't match the experiences of various European revolutions. The, the key thing there being the legacy of white supremacy and how that played out um, from the development of chattel slavery onward. Uh, so it's not surprising, I think, that there are, uh, I believe, at least three former members of the group who are now professional, or at least at a certain point became professional historians. Um, so it's, it, there is a strong sense of the importance of history and US history in particular in that process. Uh, okay, uh, yes, you. Uh, what was there, you mentioned that they did uh, some uh, United Front with the Puerto Rican independence mm -hmm. movement. How was uh, that relation and with which organizations? Sure. Um, I don't think they would have ever. Have, I don't. I do not think they would have characterized it as a united front. They did use that term in different spots, but I don't think they ever used it to describe the work that they did um, in solidarity with the independence movement. Um, they aligned themselves with a fairly small organization um, that developed in the mid to the late 1970s. It was called the Movement for National Liberation, or MLM, which was originally a binational group of some Mexican revolutionaries and some Puerto Rican revolutionaries. Um, it was very active in Chicago, and because Chicago was sort of home base for STO, uh, that was um, a, a big, important thing. Um, the MLN had uh, effectively fraternal relations with a small organization on the island that was called the Puerto Rican Socialist League, um, that was headed by a guy named Juan Antonio Correjer. Um, so there, were, there was this sort of network of a, a small branch of the independence movement that STO identified itself with. And it's important to note that in that context, STO was one of several predominantly or exclusively white organizations that latched themselves on to the MLN um, LSP uh, milieu, if you will, um, in reaction against the ways in which the Puerto Rican Solidarity Committee, which is this sort of broad-based um, anti-imperialist pro-Puerto Rican independence construct, had played out over the course of the mid-70s and its relationship to the Puerto Rican Socialist Party, which was the sort of hegemonic Puerto Rican left organization of its era, the early to mid-1970s. So um, that's, I mean, that's sort of a long and kind of nerdy answer to your question. Um, they saw their role as effectively popularizing support for Puerto Rican independence among non-Puerto Rican sectors of the populations where they worked. Um, so that was largely white folks, um, but not necessarily exclusively. Uh, and I, I hope that answers the, the question as yeah, well. As uh, actually, the BSP was a follower of the MPI, pro-independence movement, and before the mid-70s, there were, you know, other broad solidarity movements with sure. Puerto Rico and with the MPI. Yep. And certainly the MLN was one of the, if not the smallest, mm -hmm. of the organizations. Yep. That, you know, so. Yes, absolutely. The, the MLN was always a very small organization. Um, it was often quite dogmatic. Uh, yes. It had what STO perceived as an important redeeming character in that it actively, vocally, and unhesitatingly supported um, armed struggle on behalf of Puerto Rican independence. And that was a very controversial position within a group like the PSP. Um, and for STO, it was an important kind of dividing line. So that's what led STO, I think, in a lot of ways to align itself specifically with the MLM. Um, an entire chapter of my book an overwhelming majority of one chapter of the book is devoted to trying to sort of track that relationship. And um, so, you know, I could go on. That, one of the things that drew me to STO originally was that I, uh, as a young anarchist arriving in Chicago in the mid-1990s, spent a number of years working in and around the Puerto Rican community with the last vestiges of what had been the MLN. Um, so uh, when I discovered that this group that I was already interested in had a, a similarly kind of critical engagement, sometimes frustrating, um, problematic <coughs> encounter with the MLN, you know, a couple decades previous. 
that was sort of an extra thing that kind of piqued my interest. So, um, so yes. This follows up somewhat on your res your reply to to uh, Brian. Which I wonder if you could just clearly articulate for us what was STO's understanding of 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 the role that white supremacy had played within U.S. history. I mean, I imagine there's debate about it, obviously, but I mean, if there are key points of debate within that, you know, probably overall agreement that it's really important, mm -hmm. that it's, it's fucked up class consciousness, sure. et cetera, whatever. And then, and then what did that mean for practice in terms of that understanding? And maybe a footnote to that would be, I mean, did the work of Ted Allen figure into their understanding at all in the invention of the, uh, of the white race? Something I've been kind of into lately uh, through Jeff Perry. I don't know if you know but yeah. Uh, on that last point, yes, absolutely. Um, Ted Allen was never a member of STO, but he was close comrades during pretty much the entire time STO was around and before with Noel and Nitton. Um, uh, so Allen's ideas were hugely important inside STO. STO repeatedly published a bunch of, of talks and pamphlets and stuff that, that Allen produced um, in the early 70s. Um, so, uh, in terms of the, the sort of central role of white supremacy, they very much adhered to kind of Ted Allen's line on that, which for people who aren't familiar with the work of Ted Allen, he basically advanced this argument that said um, white supremacy was the active, intelligent, um, deliberate creation of uh, effectively the planter class in coastal Virginia in the late 17th century, um, and that the idea was to avoid sort of cross-racial um, uh, class-based uprisings, of, of which there were many in, the, in the, that region of Virginia in the 17th century, um, by creating a set of racially-based distinctions and attendant privileges for people who were identified as white. Um, so. Uh, effectively, the common status as bond servants um, gets turned into um, a limited status of indentured servitude for a certain number of years for white people and heritable chattel status for all black people and all of their descendants. Um, uh, so that was basically this, in, in STO's eyes, was this sort of pivotal moment in the development of how white supremacy was used as a, a wedge to divide the class. Um, so. The vision was um, to create a broad-based class struggle. You cannot do that in a United States context without first dismantling the division between black workers and white workers. And that is a, it's a huge running theme throughout STO's existence, but especially during the early years when it's actively working in multiracial factory settings. And the practical terms that you wanted to hear about in, in factory settings that basically almost always amounted to what are the demands of um, the extant black radical caucus on the shop floor um, and how do we rally white workers to demands even and especially when those demands do not speak to the immediate needs of the white workers themselves, which was this sort of quixotic approach to, and that was what a lot of what led some people to label it as moralistic was um, you're, you're forcing white people to take action that doesn't um, benefit them in any immediate sense. Um, and STO always had a hard time understanding why that was perceived as a, a bad or a difficult thing, um, sort of advancing the argument that there's always a moral imperative in any revolutionary struggle um, that does not simply resolve to immediate practical gains. Um, and I mean, I'd, I'd say that's a position that I would share in, in those terms as well. Uh, but that's sort of an example of how it played out in terms of the, the factory work. And that changed over time as SDO involved itself in different areas of, of work. Um, yes? Yeah, well, say any organization that strives to bring about real change in this world must put as a prime component of this program and activities the discrimination against women first. Because that is the oldest form of discrimination and the most widespread form. The majority of African American males in this country have varying types of conscious and unconscious discrimination against women. And it is extremely horrible here in the United States. Just over the past year, I've been doing some different types of investigation 
and it's worse than I ever, every day I find out something new. It's horrible here in the United States discrimination against women. And so we have to be against color discrimination, religious discrimination, but women should be at the forefront because that was the foundation of oppression in this world. Uh, it, it's very interesting that you phrase it in those terms because especially following on a question about Ted Allen, I, I found a, a fascinating letter um, that Ted Allen wrote to Noel Ignaton that, that was then sort of disseminated amongst the membership of STO uh, in 1978, I think. Um, that goes over a, a whole range of subjects. He's very critical of, of STO's turn toward anti-imperialist solidarity, for instance. Um, but one of the things that he goes on about at great length is more or less exactly what you're saying, that he feels that STO has turned its back on the central role of oppression of women and resistance to patriarchy and has articulated this position that effectively says um, the, you know, the condition of women can be so substantially improved under capitalism as to basically eviscerate um, male supremacy. Um, and he's harshly critical of that position. And um, so I spend some time in the book trying to sort of track that argument, both Alan's contribution to it and some subsequent responses inside STO as well. Yes? Where are they now? Uh, are there any that they gravitated towards? Uh, I've been saying that I could divide the people that I had encounters with, which again is only a small fraction of the total former membership, but the people that I had encounters with I think are can be divided into effectively two camps. One is a camp of people who have more or less thrown in the towel um, and either retreated from political engagement entirely or have sort of made their long-term peace with the um, impossibility of revolution, let's say, uh, and, and engage at this point on a sort of, you know, we don't like Obama, but we hold our nose kind of level. Uh, and the other camp is people who are still um, critically involved in varying forms of radical political activity. Uh, and so some of that I talked a little bit about in terms of um, people who, who got their feet wet with, with Occupy in different places. Um, a lot of that comes in the form of kind of small scale, limited scope mentoring relationships with younger radicals um, that involve a lot of sort of backstage conversations, if you will. Um, certainly there is a legacy, um, for instance, in terms of my own experience in the 1990s doing um, sort of anti-fascist organizing. There was a legacy of people who had been actively involved in STO who were subsequently actively involved in other anti-fascist work. That was a, a, an area of work that was very important to STO for a period of time. I talk about it a little bit in the book. Um, so it hasn't been a total loss, I would say. Um, it's you know, one thing that somebody pointed out to me is, uh, I think Max Albaum in his book Revolution in the Air talks about the striking number of people. It's a small, small in number, but notable fact that certain people who had been very prominent in the new communist movement ended up engaging completely on the other side of things, either as sort of large scale um, uh, investor, you know, sort of executive types, or as you know, politicians or whatever. Um, there's effectively none of that in the, the former membership of STO. Um, so, uh, so for whatever that's worth, um, there's nobody who you know gives a black eye to the. Well, I mean, I don't know. Depends on your perspective, I guess. There are probably people who were in the group who think everybody else gives a black eye to you know their their you know they were the only ones who held firm. But my perspective, um, you know, there's people who are kind of, meh, but nobody who, you know, is totally wretched, if that makes sense. <laughs> I, re I realize it's a low bar to set, but I feel like that is the, <laughs> is the legacy of that era, is that there's a lot of people who, you know, who didn't meet that low bar. <laughs> what about a swollen eye instead of a black eye? <laughs> Fair enough, yeah, I, perhaps an allergic reaction. Um, <laughs> inflammation of the... <laughs> Just letting you know. It's like eating peanuts or something. Yeah. Well, I mean, how could his eye would look if it is swollen? What? You see what I'm well, saying? How could his eye would look if it is swollen? That's a good point. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I just want to make a word. I know, I know. I, 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 
I get the, the it is one of those metaphors that has certain certain overtones. Um, do we have any other questions? Oh, do you know that if you if you kill a woman, you cannot be guilty of manslaughter? No. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. Um, <laughs> it's a man's <laughs> uh, And lions and tigers and sharks, and they don't eat women, they don't eat men. Women don't taste good. Men eat sharks, men eat lions, men eat tigers. <laughs> All right, I, I don't know, should we say that that's a, I just that's make, a wrap? Yeah, I got uh, two announcements. Absolutely. Uh, this has all been recorded, thankfully, and it will be up on zinlectures.wordpress.com, hopefully by the end of the week. And are we actually, the Zin Lecture Series is our first international speaker coming on June 4th, here at Encuentro Cinco at 6 o'clock. That's Richard Seymour, he's the uh, from the United Kingdom, and he writes the blog Lenin's Tomb, and he's going to be talking about his new book, American Insurgents, A Brief History of American Anti-Imperialism. So I hope you can join us for that, and I think we should give our speaker a round of applause.